Hello, welcome to theCUBE Pod, episode 55. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal from the noise. We're doing the podcast from Las Vegas, where we're doing the Cube for the second week in a row. It's a hot event um, season, it's kicking off. Dave, you know, we got 18 interviews under the belt. We're live here in, in Vegas, and it's awesome, right? And so we got a lot of news to cover. Uh, here, obviously, SaaS is an old company, uh, been around for 47 years, and they got a fucking opportunity, big time. Well, I mean, this big company, there's a, there's, a th there's a three, let's call it 3.1, 3.2 billion dollar company that has been <laughs> founded in like 1976, right? And That's a little league. Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. I was <laughs> not even driving, right? So, <laughs> but, so, and they've expend, extended their platform way beyond you know, what everybody knows, used to know SaaS about, and so they are, they are in a good position. I think they, they're going to be probably one of the, the they, they, they've got to be one of the largest private companies in tech, yeah. right, at three billion. They're this founder-led company. They're going to go public. We, we they're had, trying to go public. Yeah, they're going to go public. They've been sort of threatening to do that now for like three or four years. You know, Dr. Jim Goodnight came by did a little photo op with us, but he's like hardcore, like geek. I mean, he's coder. He's still coding at his yeah. age. He codes every day. Well, SAS right, that's in, in the next, they're in the middle of the AI wave. We're seeing massive news coming in. The new AI models there, they're doing some stuff here. We'll come back to SAS and All cover right. this. We covered like a blanket over here. We have tons of Cuban interviews. If you're interested in SAS, check it out. Um, we have the Chips Act, big bucks, um, um, Giveaway, come, more money going out. Um, going Samsung, to Samsung. Samsung right? got a big chunk. Micron reportedly next. Um, a lot of content, and then you know, the big news is is that you know uh, Anthropic this week put out a new ma language model, um, Opus, that's got great performance. And today, Meta details Llama 3, 8 billion and 7 billion parameter models, reducing false refusals. Upcoming models are trained on 15 trillion plus tokens that has 400 billion parameters. So the arms race, as we talked about last time, is happening. So we are wait, seeing a massive model coming out, and again, I just, I just picked so this up. Eight so billion, eight angle. billion parameter model that was trained on, like, what do you say, a gazillion so, uh, parameters? So 400 billion. So by, that's going to run on, okay. on your iPhone. Okay, the first two LLMs in the lineup that they featured, eight billion and 70 billion parameters. Those are running, okay. oh, eight billion are run on your iPhone. They're going to expand them. With, 70 they're billion. They're going to expand with additional mm. models that feature more than Maybe four, by 400 billion parameters, okay? So this is what it means. Our conversation about meta being in the game is true. These guys are going to be huge, large scale. Again, they should have changed their name not from Facebook to Metaverse or Meta, they should have changed their name to AI because they're going to be an AI infrastructure. And I think, again, my prediction, we're going to maybe look at the tape later on, but remember I said they could be the next AWS? You, they could be the next AWS for AI, what AWS was for, for startups. But a, a, AWS is, is up in their game <laughs> as well. Like you know, Anthropic and then Swami just posted about Llama, so already it's in bed. Well, what about Olympus, which is coming? Right, that's, that's what's rumored to be coming. But you know, you know those insurance commercials with the mayhem guy yeah. comes around, he you know, yeah. he's, like, causes <laughs> havoc, everybody goes, that's like meta, what they did with, with, with large language models. They're they came comfortable. in and said, we're going to open source <laughs> our stuff, we got tons of, of resources, and they are, we heard they're building, what, million GPU cluster, is their kind of North Star, yeah, right, I mean. to, 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 to power meta. Yeah. Right. And, so they're at the forefront of this stuff, and they're saying, "Yeah, we're going to open source it." Just, just like they did with o OCP, they had a huge, you know, impact on the future of infrastructure. So we're seeing it again. It's awesome. Google fired 28 workers over a sit-in protest of, of protesting its business ties with Israel. So that's interesting. What they do? What, what, what Google, happened? It's on Silicon Angle. Google I missed that. Fired 28 employees for what? Over sit-in protesting its business ties with Israel five hours ago. Stability AI laid off 10% of its staff in the wake of CEO resignations. These are the top headlines on siliconangle.com right now. So wait, yeah. what, these Google employees were sitting in because Google has what, a relationship with the government of Israel? Yeah. But well, they're no. not supposed to do business no, with? No, doing business in Israel, not with the government, just by the fact that they're doing business in Israel. In Israel. Yeah, the protest took place 
okay, in the previous day, inside two offices but, but, in New York and in Sunnyvale. So it was an orchestrated, basically, sit-in. Now remember, this week also saw the um, protest at the Golden Gate Bridge. And so you have people you know, in our country just blocking it. So there's a huge issue, the Palestinians and the Israelis, the whole thing around World War III, you know, the missiles that were being fired. Um, I mean, there's a lot of this disruption. So Google's firing people. That's interesting to see a company that had employees that once said, I won't work for a company that's doing AI. So Google is coming down hard, like, rightfully so, and I, think, I applaud Google for this. Yeah, they took over he, office he, spaces, defaced our property, and physically impeded the work of other Googlers. All right, we'll see you. Yeah, good luck, go to jail. Look at, the, that has to, this whole stuff has to stop. So I'm happy to see Google step up and not play to the, the crowd. The protesters reportedly took over the building's 10th floor. New York Police Department said the sit-in involved about 50 people, four of whom were arrested for trespassing. All right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, good. <laughs> good <laughs> good riddance. I mean, what's Google not supposed to do business in Israel? I, I don't understand. What's the, what's the, That's, you know, just because of the whole, I mean, look, what's happening in Gaza is horrible. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean. Okay, but what's that to do with Google? I mean, I don't know. Maybe, I'd love to hear the other side of that story. What's your take on I Meta? I mean, this is a top story today, obviously. Meta claims both Llama Model 3's beat similar models from Gemini, Mistral, and Claude 3 on certain benchmarks. Humans marked Llama 3 higher than GPT 3.5. Yeah, this is the uh, common, this is We the, are playing the benchmark game now, Dave. Yeah, totally, this is the leapfrog, the ping pong. Right, you, you even heard a um, guy from Intel today, hear what he said, did you hear the nuance he said? Yeah, yeah Gaudi 3 is one and a half times greater than, than the performance than any other you know, a, a, a large you know, GPU that's in the market today. Talking about- That's NVIDIA's chip. Yeah, talking about- That they've spent how many years building? But, but he's talking about, right, he's talking about Grace Hopper, but Gaudi 3's not even in market yet. Okay, so everybody's playing these games, right? So whenever you hear benchmark, even when you hear uh, Blackwell be uh, benchmarking, benchmarketing, I should say, you got to dig in, you gotta, you gotta, because, you just got to question everything in the benchmarking. Ask what the workload is. You know, is it is it is it real world workload? And just look at how they're playing tricks. Of course, they're going to do that. They should do that because it is benchmarking. Netflix reports Q1 revenue up 15% year over year, 9.3 billion versus 9.2 billion. Paid users up 16%. So Netflix is interesting, John. Net income up to 2.3 billion, up from 1.3, a billion dollar. Increase in net income. Because you know how you know what's happening there is the, is, the, is there. I mean, as a network, Netflix user, you use Netflix. I do too. My family does. They remember they they initiated this no password sharing. Okay, so they they turned the crank on that. Mm -hmm. Now they get their compares are getting much much tougher, but they still have another crank to turn because their their password sharing uh, crackdown was initially I think on just TVs. Now they're hitting your phones. <laughs> so they got another, another little lever they can, they can pull, but then the compares get pretty tough for Netflix, so because so, they spend so, so much here, money on content. Here's an interesting rumor I want to get your thoughts on. Cloud security startup Wiz is in advanced talks to acquire a competitor Lacework for 150 million to 250 million. Lacework raised- For how raised, much? Ra 150 to 200 million. Come on, they Lacework, Lacework weighs a billion dollars. 1.8 billion. Oh my value gosh. 8.3 billion. Wow, what a what a fail. Well, that we see. They're crater. We, we I, you know I reported on this, and you can see in the in the ETR data what I did is I I correlated the size of the raise with the market penetration, and then normalized it by uh, by 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 that size of the raise, and so. You could see for the amount of money that they had raised, they should be way, way outperforming the market. And then here's Wiz in that data was doing really well. So wow, Wiz acquiring Lacework. Hmm, that's that's a um, that's a signal. That's a, um, that's a Spicer company, you know. Lacework. Yeah, and Jay Jay Perk. Cube alumni so, and so, Megan Eisenberg's the CMO. So, so I wonder if they had a go-to-market problem or product problem. So, well, they just well, raised a lot of dough. They got out over their skis. They probably, they probably tried to scale. I don't really know the story, but they probably tried to scale go to market before they had the right product market fit, right? Wow, 250 million yeah. on a on a two billion dollar raise. Well, what happened was they raised a ton of dough 
when snow the right right around the snowflake IPO, right? They were they were the snowflake was really hot, right? It was b very bubblicious. Spicer had the golden touch, and so they were able to raise a ton of money. Remember, we had Dave Hatfield on, and he, and he had he said, "Look, we're going to approach security as a data problem." They weren't wrong, and, and they were right they, about they that. They probably got the product, and, right. and they were right about that. But guess who else? Were, uh, approaches security as a data problem. Everyone else. CrowdStrike, <laughs> CrowdStrike. Palo Alto Network, <laughs> right? I mean, Okta, <laughs> so. Zscaler. Right? They, right? yeah. It's a data problem, those guys too. Well, that, they have the gonna, same premise. So, so it's a signal to me that, as we've been reporting on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE, that essentially the consolidation is happening. Yeah. The, the clients, customers don't want all these different vendors in there. Um, and you're seeing, we're hearing it everywhere. So, to me, we're gonna, I'm going to dig in that story a little bit more, find out more information. Uh, on a lighter note. At the same time, you see all these startups getting money, on a and lighter we're going to see it RSA. On a lighter note, you're going to love this one, Dave. This is right up your alley, because you, you like the self-driving car stuff. DARPA, okay, the Department of Defense, reveals that an AI-controlled X-62A jet successfully faced a human pilot in an F-16 during an, an in-air dogfight test that carried out in 2023. So apparently, they ran an AI pilot plane against a human. No way. Yeah. And, and it did well. Yeah, it did well. Wow, so here's the thing. And so they got video on, so this, this is a story from The Verge. So the title of the video is just, Air Force confirms first successful AI dogfight. That's, that's a good one, that's an awesome story. So I'm fascinated by this. Um, dogfighting was the problem to solve so we can start testing you know, autonomous artificial intelligence systems says Bill Gray, the chief test pilot at the Air Force Test Pilot School. Hey, Top Gun's going to not need a pilot. Remember that whole Top Gun yeah. too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a, you're so, a relic. So we... <laughs> well, so you're going to be... Drones will take over your job. It's, it's funny, I'm such a flip-flopper on this one because, you know, we, we had our little AGI bet and I was saying, it's going to happen before Looks the like end. I'm going to win that one. It's going to happen before the end of the decade. Who knows, right? So the bet should be, will I be alive by the end I know, of the decade? I know, right. And so I did like, my Twitter poll. Go to my Twitter, at Di Vellante, and take my poll. Um, so right now it's 48% or by 2030. 39% many decades, 9% say centuries, and 4% say never will we see That's those, AGI. Yeah, but those, so, those, but are the, here's, those are the, the deniers. But so here's what, yeah, right, I mean, like, I think like it's coming. Here's what I'm say. So I've kind of been a, a full self-driving skeptic, as you know, and some of my deep AI buddies have, we read, I think, uh, was it last week or two weeks ago, one of my friends with a whiteboard session, I still got to do that, so I've kind of been a skeptic there, but I really do believe AGI is coming. So I, I, it's kind of a flip-flop by me, because if you, if, you, if you believe AGI is coming, then it'll solve full self-driving. But So check this out. So TSMC, CEO, says the company plans to charge more for making chips outside Taiwan, citing higher costs yeah, you, due to a fragmented globalization environment. Well, plus it's labor, right? So And their earnings just came out. So. They, their they beat, revenue's up 16% year over year, um, and then their net income up 8.9% to 6.9 billion, up from 6.6 .6 billion. But the stock okay. is not doing well. So the stock did, did very the poorly. The earthquake on that, on that hit Taiwan on April 3rd caused 92.4 million in damages, uh, and, and, and uh, there was no power out of it. So if you, if, if, have you ever heard Morris Chang talk about no. um, labor in Taiwan? So. He, he, I'll, I'll paraphrase my takeaways. He would say things like high-end engineers who lived you know, miles and miles away, like hundreds of miles away, would take the fast the bullet train into to TSM, and they would live there for the week, away from their families, and just work like 18-hour days. Okay, you're never going to get that in, in the United States. Okay, so that's one. The second was he would, he would tell a story about... Um, the line workers, you know, they're, they're skilled, but they're a lot of women doing their job. And it, he said in the United States, a lot of the women, they would cycle through them so fast because, you know, it was a burnout job, but they would never produce a chip that yielded, okay? <laughs> and so he said in Taiwan, these, these, these workers, again, a lot of women, they'll just sit there at the telescope all day, you know, doing what they do, the, the, the basic work of building these chips, um, the technicians, and the yields are much, much higher. Yeah. And so he's saying that the culture in the United States is really not conducive to- Yeah, I remember that. You, you, performing you, you like that. You the last pod. Y yeah, and so 
I so mean, that's interesting the that they're going to charge more. Yeah, the U.S. is new to this. And again, we heard here Intel say in the Cube at this event in Vegas that you know there's going to be real pressure to keep it in the country. And and so the U.S. just awarded Samsung 6.4 billion in the Chips Act funding. It says the company plans to make two nanometer chips in its Taylor, Texas plant by 2026, two years ahead of TSMC. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. If they pull that off, that puts America through Samsung's team, the American manufacturing, in a position. So, you know, we could be living in an era before we die, seeing where you have to only get chips from national, national companies. I mean, if we have this geopolitical environment where you got World War III going on in the Middle East, okay, and then you got the whole Cold War going on, Cold Chip War going on with uh, China and that whole part of the world, you might, you know, maybe the U.S. is a good call to put everything in America. So we're going to watch this very closely because we know Intel's behind. Well, you're not going to put EUV machines in America. So ASML missed its earnings and, and the stock got crushed and it's taking all the semiconductor stocks down. And, and, and I think basically because a lot of these um, fabs are holding off on buying these machines because they're trying, <laughs> these machines cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So you don't want to start buying new ones until you really need them um, because you got to get the, the machines online, so you don't want to overbuy. Um, so that's what's taken the whole semiconductor industry down. My point is, you have choke points all across the semiconductor supply chain. You've got thin film technologies coming out of Japan. You have EUV technologies coming out of the Netherlands. You have um, uh, cadence design systems and, and, and other software that's critical to making chips in Silicon Valley. You've got Taiwan is the world's number one manufacturer of advanced chips. So I understand why Gina Raimondo and certainly Pat Gelsinger has been on this and President Biden, they all want, and we want, chips to be manufactured, advanced manufacturing in the United States, but the supply chain is still very fragile. So it's good that they do that. The question that we've raised in the Cube Pod over and over and over again is, where do you place your bets? Gina Raimondo would say, okay, we're, they're sprinkling a little to Intel, a little to Samsung, a little to, to, to TSM. The fact that the TSM and Samsung are already building these advanced chips in volume at high yields says to me that they're miles ahead of Intel Foundry. And so, you know, hey, we heard today from, you know, off, off camera that they're optimistic yeah. of the economics, the Intel, but we, Intel's, we, Intel's got something up their sleeve, or they don't. Well, again. I mean, it's either they have it or the they thing, don't. Here's the thing, Intel's, the, the vast majority of Intel's volume in Foundry is Intel captive volume. The vast majority of Intel captive volume comes from PCs. IDC has PCs units growing 1.5% this year. Ergo, how does Intel uh, 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 conform to rights law, which says you've got to double your cumulative volume to lower your costs. The only way they do that is to steal a lot of share from TSM and Samsung. But if TSM and Samsung Global have, have the, the, the market uh, lead, they are such a distant third. How do they catch up and steal share to get the volume? That's their big challenge. Glo meanwhile, global smartphone shipments grew 7.8% year to year at 289 million in Q1. iPhone fell 9%. So that's all Android okay. is growing. Yeah, so. Have we seen that moment where there's finally <laughs> the Android, the openness of Android is going to catch iPhone? Kind of like, remember the old Mac? Remember Mac it really yeah, got in trouble yeah. because Windows just had such an open ecosystem, was so much more cost effective? But I don't know, will security play a role in that? The Android's kind of scary to me. Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> right. I think Apple's just maybe maxed out their market. They have all the billions of people holding the iPhones. Here's a story you're going to like, Dave. Cloud data manager said Rubrik's going public, you know that. Yeah, And the Bipple. rumor is they're selling 23 million shares between 28 and $31 each, raising 700 million plus. We got to get- At a $5.4 billion valuation. We got to get Bipple back on. Get his, we had him on one of the super clouds. We should get him on and talk about the IPO. Probably can't say much right now because they're in quiet period. But. Here's a story for you. Okay, this falls off of my, my um, interview I did with the Gartner announced that Google Cloud next. Broadcom questioned by the EU over VMware licensing changes. Oh, surprise, Dave. April 15th, article in Reuters. They're doing exactly what they said they're going to do. <laughs> Antitrust regulators about change to newly acquired VMware license conditions. This is what they're talking about. Did you see Hoktan's letter? Yeah. 
It was a good letter. It was a good letter. It was like really cogent. He's, it's, I'm amazed at this guy, how well he understands his different markets. I, I, I said from day one, I think, well, we'll see if they keep the community and the event going. They lost the end user computing group. They're spinning that one out. But they got enough meat on the bone to have VMware Explore uh, event. And also they have um, all the top customers. And so I really believe they factored into their model that who cares if people are going to not use vSphere? We don't want the freebies. It looks like they're going to kill the free version. Yeah. They, they, so that's going to basically hurt the vMugs of the world. It, and if you look at, say, um, their strategy, they're going to get all the top accounts and that's going to make, that's part of the plan. It, now, they might have, they might forecast, this is what I'm exploring in my story, did they over rest, underestimate the switching cost problem? So what's going to be very easy to, to what's going to be very easy to tell quickly is, the people that are revolting, are they one, in that market basket of customers that they don't care if they move? And number two, is there an alternative? So yeah. is that Nutanix? Is that going to be OpenStack? Is that going to be Oracle? Is that going to be Zen. Google? So that you have, we're going to have a lot of things to look at there. Listen, uh, here's my take on that. First of all, Hoctan's letter was interesting. What my takeaway was he said, look, we are investing. We're going to focus our R&D our and we're going to continue to add value and, and translation, we, you and I know that VMware has the best virtualization hypervisor management on the planet, and if you want to run a private cloud that, has, that is substantially runs like a public cloud, VMware has the best solution for you. So he's going to continue to invest in that and say, look, switching costs, to your point, are going to be higher than it is to pay us. Now, my advice to customers is get your best people involved and negotiate, okay? Everything's up for negotiation. Yeah. Have a conversation. And so, yeah. so the big thing, the big question I have for Broadcom is how are they going to service all these customers? And I think the answer is they're going to go to their top uh, OEMs like Dell, like HPE, we know who they are, I don't have to list them. Okay, we're and, not bringing, we're and not, NetApp, no, et cetera. We're not going to see that. I think you're going to see, and, and, and people then, pay the license over, they don't want to negotiate. Well, you got to negotiate, you got to try. We'll see. And see where they're at. And that story. Yeah, well, I mean, I, do, I think they will negotiate. I mean, they're going to, they're here's, gonna, a, here's a, they don't want to lose these customers, they don't want to lose the, the, the profits, and if it's profitable, and it's, if it's highly profitable business, they'll. Well, Hawk Tan's view is, it's not making money. No, no but I, I think you say, look, th this is how Broadcom operates. Broadcom is saying, listen, if you commit to us, you know, we'll give you good value. Yeah, I think. I so think. If, if, they, if you commit for longer term deals, it, essentially, hey, if you let us lock in, lock you in, here's the deal. We will continue to invest in your, your, your roadmap, our roadmap for you. And they will. That, yeah. The difference between. And they just launched the, private AI this people, week. So we were, right, did a so research people, on that. People used to say, used to compare Broadcom to a PE company that would just suck all the profits out and, th and, and, and then throw away the carcass after it's done. That's not what Broadcom does. What Broadcom does is they narrow down and they focus the R&D and they continue to invest in R&D. We heard this from Charlie Cowis on the semiconductor side. It's very similar <clears throat> in VMware. They look for durable markets, they invest, they want to be number one in technology so that they can quote unquote, lock you in. It is a lock-in, but the lock-in is with, with the best product. So, so they've here, got the best product, but customers are pissed. There's no question about it. <laughs> customers say, I'm, I'm paying 90% more. I've heard customers tell me their bill went up 500%. I, I, I got to dig into that and see. So, okay, so what are you going to do? You're going to re-architect your entire infrastructure, which is running great? Mm, we'll see. Dave, you're going to like this story. Remember Amazon reinvent when they rolled out the 18-wheeler truck? Yeah. They have snowballs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a snowball, and then they called it Snow snowmobile. Cone, snowmobile. Snowmobile. Snowmobile was the 18-wheeler. Yeah. So here's the headline today. Amazon discontinues its snowmobile service, an 18-wheeler truck introduced in 2016 to help customers move large amounts of on-premise data to aid its facilities. It's the end of the road for the truck. Wow. <laughs> I saw... Amazon is, so the, what that, that tells me is, one, it was one of those, their big announcements that they made features on stage. It also too tells me that we will start seeing the 
shedding of all those Amazon services that are going to be not crossing the chasm to the next generation uh, AI a version of AWS. In this one, it's pretty clear that no one's truckloading their data to the Amazon facility. Did you see Michael Dell's tweet on this? No. It's not on this, but it's on repatriation. Charles Fitzy will love this. Michael Dell, he said, multi-cloud including on-prem and co-location is the clear trend, somewhat driven by the growth in AI inference and data gravity. 83% of enterprise CIOs in Barclays survey plan to repatriate at least some workloads in 2024, up from the low point of 43% in 2020, H2. Hashtag PowerFlex. <laughs> He's always selling products, I love it. And so, this shows, look at this, it shows dramatic, this is the light blue here, sorry you can't see this, is planning some kind of repatriation in the first half of 24. 83, 83, no, 83 respondents out of uh, 100. Wow, that's a lot. But who knows what that means, right? It could be they, they did a, 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 a test dev in the cloud and now they're moving it on-prem. Oh yeah, we're repatriating. So you know who knows what that really is. It's, you certainly don't see repatriation in the revenue numbers, right? I mean, the, the cloud continues to grow at you know, solid double digits, right? 20 plus percent. And on-prem is growing, you know, yeah. mid-single digits. Inter so, interesting story, I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Yeah, thanks for well, spinning me up. We, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. How about Kara today? Saying, sounded like Lena Khan up there about AT and the AT&T breakup. Did you hear that? Yeah, Kara was very woke up there and very, very much. Um, she was good. She was good, but she was definitely not holding back any punches because. <laughs> when did she ever? What, what, <laughs> my favorite line of the day was, not that I want to see my fellow tech leaders get skewered, but she's right. There's no real accountability around regular, um, their performance. And she used the example of the Alaska Airlines door that flew off everyone knows. Explain that, explain what, what her issue was. Her issue is, is that they're not accountable. So in, in Alaska, she's the Alaska Airline. The door came off, everyone saw her, and there was even a spoof, the iPhone survived. And, and so everyone's like, oh my God, the door blew up. I could die, it's an airplane, people are on it, and people could get killed. Yeah, that was airplane safety hairy. is pretty important. We all fly around, <laughs> so we know, we hope that it's strict. So, Which is where you want regulators the, the, paying attention. So everyone went batshit crazy. The CEO gets fired, okay, over a door exploding. And no one got hurt, but it could, oh my God, they're terrible, they're doing their safety check. Right. Someone fucked up. Okay, even if the plane did crash, which it did, thank God, it's still a tragedy, but the, just the possibility that they don't have their act together. The guy gets fired, the CEO. So, okay, so okay. The, her point so was? Her point was, Mark Zuckerberg, Sundar Pakai, all these people run these companies, um, that are, some would say, is irresponsible. Facebook certainly has done things that everyone now knows um, to make a profit, and there were consequences that are far worse than a plane crashing. How many people have died because of overlooking some of the things on Facebook? The, 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 un, the um, teens, lawless, teens lawlessness, suicide. lawlessness of the activities on the network, the lack of oversight, things they didn't do. They chose profit over actually making a better platform safe. And that's why shows like this at SAS, trust and safety is causing all kinds of backlash. So what Swish is saying is, there's no even laws to cover these guys. They're because riding they're behind the, the, the FCC Act in 1996 that said, hey, you know, you're section, what is it, 300, or whatever? Section 203. 203, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it's your platform. And so what she's saying is the tech industry it has no one, like there's no accountability there. The other thing she's saying is, and this is I think the tech bro pile on, but, and you know, I kind of feel the same way as her, there's a lot of bros out there, but, um, and they, they think they're entitled. I think there's some entitlement that, and we've talked about this on the pod many times, and on the cube. There was an era of entitlement that I'm a tech bro, look at me, and uh, I can do anything. Um, and so she's saying, X number of people, a homogeneous group of people are making software that's designed for the whole world. So that's really not representative to what needs to happen. So that's a legitimate point too. But you know, and her point is that AI needs data. So Swisher has been doing her homework. So through her podcast, through her work she's doing, she's plugged in at the epicenter of all the action. And so I thought she did a great job. Um, one, being uh, the flair for the dramatic, because she's always great. 
you know, on that. And I thought she was really well informed. You know, she is over the top on certain issues, you know, and I respect that actually. I've always liked Kara Swisher. I never really, I mean, people take issue with Kara Swisher. I've always liked her. So uh, she's quality. She knows the reporter. Score. And when she goes after somebody, it's either, it's either because they pissed her off or they're a bad person. And she, I mean, she's like that. She's like, she will basically grind hard on someone if they're a total jerk. Yes. Yeah, and so sometimes it, it might be personal too, like her and Elon Musk are, are going at it huge. So her, her, her point, I think, was we have to have a national privacy policy, right? She was very strong on that. And then, but she followed that up with, I had to, I had, again, she triggered me. She said something to the effect of, if we didn't break up AT&T, we'd be carrying around a brick for a phone. And that was deregulation that-, that, that, that That's that, just a dog whistle and, for- And uh, so, but so I said, it was not, oh, hey, that's okay. But it wasn't all good. The baby bells, they dragged their feet on broadband, remember? And then they merged with each other and with cable companies so they got bigger and stupider. And oh, Bell Labs, a gem of United States R&D, is no longer in the United States. It's owned by Nokia, so we kind of lost that. And my point is that history- at and t though, was a behemoth that needed to be broken yes, up. Yes, okay, I'm not saying they shouldn't have broken it up, but I'm just saying that to say, Lena Khan does this too, see, it was all good. It wasn't all good. It created a bunch of baby bells that-, that By the were, way, it was really bad were, because were, those baby bells Killed the the last mile opportunity yes. during the dot com. Yes, and they did. That's what I meant. They were yeah. really slow to do broad bomb, broadband. What did they do? Uh, DSL <laughs> was their answer. No, no to, they they created process that they knew was going to increase the truck roll costs for these right, as so, they open up the providers. You get access to their central office. So, and then what happened was is that that was a that it was dead. The the, the war was over before. I, I would talked. argue the following that it was. I know the, that market really it was, well. Okay, so so good. So then then help me sort of make my case here because I would say it was the deregulation that allowed guys like MCI and Sprint to compete, and that co created competition and lowered prices. It wasn't so much the breakup of AT&T as it was the, the ability of these other carriers to run on their networks and to charge less and create competition. And so my point is that market forces, yeah. are always see in tech anyway, have had better outcomes than government intervention. The IBM for years was locked up by the, the, the uh, DOJ, Microsoft, nothing really ever came I out of it. I, and, then, and, then, and then market forces, in the case of Microsoft, it was Linux and the LAMP stack. You know, in the case of well, IBM, it was the, it was the Wintel I know, but the market factor. forces are different now, Dave. So I'll give you an example. So no, this is a really good uh, on, point. On the AT&T thing, I would just say this. Good. Their hope for competition never <coughs> yeah. happened. Right, never it, happened. So, so It helped the Europeans become more competitive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure how the Europeans competed in you New go Jersey, to, but. You go um, to MWC. These, these European telcos. Yeah, but I'm talking about the U.S. here, because I'm talking about AT&T, not, not the international right. market. So um, license that. spectrum is a whole other story on that to get into, but, but uh, go ahead. spectrum map. So but that failed. Um, what Swi and, what, and Swisher's getting at is, is that when you're trying to conflate you know, other things, it's, diff it's a little bit different scope, the size and scope of that. I would say AT&T is probably compared to what's happening now, based, basically your market forces, is that what we talked with Ray Wang on our analyst panel this morning was, is that, Right now, the market's getting smaller and with a, big, a, a smaller number of big players. Yep. Okay, so customers don't have choice. So that, that is more concerning for me than the size of Apple, right? Or, so that's going to be interesting. So if what, what's happening with the market forces now is people consolidating. So, you know, there it is. But I guess if, if, if I'm Andy Jesse, I'm saying, we got a lot of competition. <laughs> we compete with Microsoft, I, we compete I've never with Google. Bought, I've never bought the argument that Amazon's a monopoly. Okay, yet. I think they have competition where Amazon has an advantage and, and I'm, how do I say this politely, they control the results. So, oh yeah, we give access to everybody. No, come on, the top search results, and it's there. Everyone knows, that statistically, everyone clicks on the top results. Okay, that's- You're the, talking about searching Amazon.com. Yeah, their search advertising is off the roof. So when you own the first- It's part funny, because I never do. Because uh, of, of that factor, I scroll down, but most people do. You know it drives well, most of the traffic. Most people that are smart look at other things like, okay, um, ratings, <laughs> rankings. Right, of course. You know, because there's a lot and, of- And then you try to parse out which ratings are fake. There's a lot of fake, fake shit yeah. on there, and there's a lot of bad yeah. quality. Right. Best price doesn't always matter. Um, 
And Amazon doesn't always have the best selection. So when I was buying my new golf clubs, okay, um, I was like, oh, wow, hmm, I want to buy, they only had one selection. The selection was weak. Amazon. They're not known for selling golf clubs, but they, they sell. A Amazon they Choice. Do, they do sell Callaway, <laughs> but they sell the brand that I don't want. Yeah. Only one brand. So I, go to, I, I had more choice on eBay. Oh, eBay's great. Than Amazon. I love eBay. Golf clubs. Right. So. Because right, there's not eBay branded products, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so eBay, I mean, I, I, I love eBay. But so I won't buy certain things on Amazon, right? If I know something's going to be some poorly made product that's coming from China, I won't buy it. Like, do you ever buy Amazon batteries? They are the worst frickin' batteries on the planet. <laughs> they're so bad, but they're cheap. You know, they sell a lot of them. So, <laughs> what else is going on? I don't know, Dave. I mean, I, I think the AI thing, um, and I think that comes with Ray Wang got my attention. People are getting laid off and there's no jobs for them, right? So you're going to start to see AI start to start doing things in non-core areas. I thought Ray said something interesting. You, you, you and he, he and you had a good exchange. If you're not in sales or engineering or some core function, those other departments won't be fully funded. They'll be co-piloted. Yeah. So what you're going to start to see is known workflows that are, that are business oriented or manufacturing oriented that, that run things, of an apparatus of a system. They're going to be looked at as where the people labor component is. So I think you're going to start to see concentrations of distributed, um, a distribution of people, of concentration of IP, people IP, labor IP, in the areas that add the most value. Sales go to market, engineering, quality, because you're in a creative job, it's creativity. But support functions, finance, HR, other stuff will be augmented with AI. Yeah, they'll still be humans, but you know, what are you talking about there? Well, so that was an interesting exchange, and my premise was you're not seeing the top line being driven uh, by, uh, uh, by AI. I mean, uh, other than NVIDIA, obviously, and Broadcom, their, their top lines are being driven by AI. I would say Google with search and Meta, with advertising, with Facebook, to the extent they can build better AI, they're going to generate more ads. But most enterprises aren't seeing top line revenue with AI. What they are potentially seeing, you saw this with RPA, is they're able to do more automation. And except, you know, a lot of, this, a lot of the RPA, I don't think RPA had the impact that AI is going to have. I mean, RPA wasn't like, hey, we're going to reduce a bunch of jobs. RPA was we maybe can avoid hiring more people and throwing more labor at the problem. So that's kind of what RPA did. What AI is doing is allowing, it is allowing people to, to it's, it's kind of giving them excuse to cut. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're saying, hey, we're bloated. You know, let's, let's spin this as automation. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, and it'll drop right to the bottom line. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know how much of that is just, hey, we're getting rid of the bottom 10% because, you know, we, we need to save money versus them spinning a story to Wall Street of, hey, we got this great automation story now with we're, so, we're such strong AI practitioners, we're applying it, and it's dropping right to the bottom, bottom line, so buy our stock. So we'll see how that all plays out. I, I think a lot of that is just smart packaging by the, the IR departments. Well, I think you're going to see a lot. My, my, my final takeaway is multimodal, uh, models are going to be key on the AI front. Having all the models in one spot is going to be key because then that way you can control the governance. I think you're going to see um, AI generate a new entrepreneurial equation and entrepreneurship is going to be um, also in, inside companies, intrapreneurship, inside a company. So uh, external entrepreneurship founders and founders teams be smaller. Um, I think that's clear. And then, and then inside a company, or even the big companies. If you can innovate with one feature with AI and make it happen, you can transform a business. That means anyone in the company can't just, doesn't have to send a memo, I have an idea, fund me. They can actually explore with things like via Workbench and get in there and actually add value. Say, I made a discovery. And then show people the proof. Yeah. That means the intellectual property of the next generation of, the, the, of this society is going to be workflows and data. And that can be applied to society and to personal lives, to business. And so I think you're going to start to see people start thinking like a systems architect. And we heard people say, you got to look at everything first. Yes, that's called a system. Yeah. You call it the value chain. I call it a bunch of components that work together that are understood and organized in a way to make something happen at runtime. Hey, compile, run, execute command. 
Um, so I think we're going to get into a very much a computer science vibe in society. And that's good for us because we love tech, deep tech, and theCUBE is uh, tech TV. So it's going to be great for us. It's going to be a tailwind for us to spin DJ on all the content. So uh, I think I love it. I'm drunk on AI. You know, I'm always drinking the AI Kool Aid. So you know, uh, the whole trust thing. Love the message of SaaS. I don't like how people are overplaying the trust factor and creating a problem where there isn't one yet. And I think there's a little bit of a warning sign. I get that, but I don't think we should be implementing policies. Let's let things run for a little bit. Let the chaos reign and then reign in the chaos. That is the prescription. And I love the Equal, uh, equal AI um, founder. I like Reggie Townsend's vision. Let's be transparent, but let's not overplay it and let's not let this stuff get hijacked by social justice warriors. And social justice warriors going to transform what is an open, transparent process to taking it over. And that's, I've seen that happen before. You've got good intentions, and, but you need to have quality people dedicated to it, otherwise it gets hijacked. I've seen that open source committees, and the best open source projects and committees are, are great. So I'll end it on that note, as far as I'm concerned, that's my take. You know, as we start rolling out the insights from these events, end-to-end -end workflows, faster, smarter AI, and you're going to start to see the intellectual property shift from the tech programmer, yeah, hey, look at me, I'm the founder, to no, technology is everywhere, the glue between all the elements, the new power player, the new fandom to, uh, to idolize is the, the value creators. Simply put, Dave, if you create value, you will be the new worshiped person in your organization, on the press. It's not, I, I am a nerd, I built the most amazing machine learning algorithm, therefore worship me. So I think the value creators will become the new superpower um, person that people will look to and say that made a difference. You get the awards, you get the promotion, you make the money, you get the, the press clippings. Creating value in an open, transparent way that moves the needle will be easier and faster to do, which means new brands are going to emerge, new talent's going to emerge, and the proof is going to be in, as you said, what's the scoreboard say? What, what did that value create? Because value has metrics to value. More revenue, lower costs, happier people, more productive, more trustful. So I think you start getting into the world where, show me. So exactly. Show me the beef. One of my predictions. Show me the 20, steak. One of my 2024 predictions was 2024 will be the year uh, of AI ROI or else. And I basically said, I don't think it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, meaning it'll throw off enough cash to do gain sharing, and if it doesn't happen, then people are going to start tightening up to your point about value. But I wanted to, I wanted to actually tell a quick story as we close. I don't know if we have time. Um, we got time. I think we got time. Rafi Meyerson, said, he listens to the podcast, and he, and he linked in me or texted me and said, hey, love the podcast. Love to learn more about like, your business, how you guys started, and, and you know, a little inside baseball on the cube. So I, I wanted to share with people, like, we don't have much time, we'll give them the short version. You and I met in 2010. Let's do that next podcast. Right? You and I met, I'll just give the short, uh, the bumper sticker. You and I met in 2010, and we, we hit it off, and then you shared with me later on the idea of the cube, and, and we were the first, obviously, to do live TV programming at shows, and so I'd love to at some point explore that story and share with people. You know how you called me when I was in Dallas and we're doing Hadoop World, get to New York. I flew to New we York dedicate in a nice a, storm. We'll dedicate an hour and we'll script up a nice Well, here's details. the thing. Let us know if you want that because I don't know. I mean, we've told that story and a lot of, a lot of our insider friends know it. But if that's something yeah. you'd be interested in, let us know. Yeah, good. Uh, All right, on that note, a little bit of a lower energy pod this week. <laughs> we're burnt out. Multiple, multiple cube gigs here in Vegas, uh, great stuff. We love what we do. We love the pod. We love talking to the experts, leaders. We're going to continue to do that in the queue. Guys, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Uh, love, love what we do. Thanks for listening to episode 55. See you next time. <laughs>